All right, I need those looking online and those in the room, get your pen and your paper out, get ready to learn. Hallelujah. God's got something good for us today. Hallelujah. I tell you, the last few weeks I have been in the face of God, and I tell you, he wouldn't let me sleep, so I'm, you better not go to sleep on this word today. If you home sitting in your bed, open your eyes and sit all the way up. It's getting ready to transform the way you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're still talking about marriage today. Everyone, say everyone, is affected by relationships. So the better your relationships are, the better you improve your life. See, relationships are very important. And I think sometimes we have just sort of gloss over them carelessly. Sometimes not uh, uh, just being uh, mean or not really want to do it. We just don't stop and understand that relationships are very, very crucial, not only to others but to our own personal development. I want to come out with this statement. <clears throat> Love is a law, and laws don't have feelings. You need to write that down. Love is a law, and laws don't have feelings. When you run the red light, it's not personal. When you get the ticket, you broke the law. The law said you're supposed to get a ticket. Love is a law, and it has no feelings. That's the first thing we need to rewrite in our, in our mindset about love. Love is not a feeling. Never has been and never will be. There are laws of love and marriage, whether you are married, unmarried, divorced, or widowed. That, notice what I didn't say, single. Because we have misused that word. I'm going to help you with that. Pastor DJ did an awesome lesson. You need to go back and look at these lessons. Because we've been, we've been teaching these, these uh, on marriage for the last three weeks at least. It's somewhere like that. But you need to go back and look at the lessons, what he taught on single. And I'm going to pick that up since he's not talking about it right now, but I won't do that today. But we're just going to carry it a little bit further. Amen. Now listen, marriage is one of the most important decisions a human will make in his or her life next to accepting Jesus. So why do we keep getting it wrong? Uh -huh. Woo. Marriage decision is more important than buying a house, more important than the vehicle you buy. But how many of you spend more time studying about the house and the vehicle? You do your research. Woo, Jesus. So you can have an expensive home, a fine car, and a horrible marriage. Many people can't live in the house they bought because they spent more money on the house than they did building their relationship. Woo. It's interesting to me. Sometimes you look at certain shows or you look at certain things or commercials or tell you, but it's interesting to me that things people work so hard to get last longer than their marriage. There's a reason. And this, this is kind of funny. In order to obtain your driver's license, you had to study the manual, do a written test, then a driving test to prove that you are qualified to drive on the street. However, say however, you can go and apply for a marriage license and never be required to study one book, never pass a test, which means our society is more concerned about your driving on the streets than they are about your life in the community. <laughs> so you can't go to the world to discover what I'm going to tell you today because they don't care about your marriage. All they want you to do is drive right. This is why the church has got to stop asking the world for advice on marriage. Only God has the answers. All right. So we know how to drive, but we don't know how to live with someone else. 
That's, that's key. Those of you who got more than one children in the house, teach them to live with each other. That's one of the things we were stickling about in the house. Now, you didn't always say children want to have arguments because that's just the way life goes. But we told our children, if you can't be friends with one another, you can't have another friend come in. It's important that you teach them to care about one another because it's going to affect their life for the rest of their life. Woo, Jesus. I know this is why it is so tough, but marriages are victims of broken hearts because somewhere somebody didn't know what to do. Some of you have tried marriage, and you have just given up on it. You just make do. I've seen some people, they, they, it's on paper, and it's on paper only. They're just making do. They're unhappy, unfulfilled, and they, know how, they don't know how to fix what they got going on. Some of you are tired of trying, so now the marriage you are in is all about you getting what you deserve because you feel like you don't suffer enough. I'm telling you. Choosing a life partner for marriage must not be taken without careful and prayerful consideration. Now, I know some of us didn't get started right, that, but I got to teach you the truth the way God designed it so you can fix what's wrong. Remember at the beginning of the year, the Lord told me not to do what? I can't call to you no more. So don't look for no easy side. This is not the sunny side A. We're going to flip it over. Ah, you just can't jump into marriage, even though they keep doing it. Listen, you need to write this down. Do you realize that there are no scriptures where God command us to be married? Come on, Christians, listen to me. I know you, you're going to hear something today that's going to help you. There are no scriptures where God command you to be married. God did not command Adam to be married to Eve. Adam did not even realize he needed help. Because he was doing what God called him unto. The best time to get married is when you don't need to be married. If you got this overwhelming need for marriage, it ain't time for you to get married. Woo, Jesus. Are you listening? You don't have to be married to be happy. So stop looking at married people and saying, oh, I just wish I was married. They look so nice together. Why are you unhappy with your singleness? God made Adam single in the beginning. He didn't have a wife. He was not on the scene when God was developing him. Mm. Marriage is a choice you make and not a requirement by God. Now let me help you with another misunderstanding in the church. God does not choose your partner for you. You waiting for the next person to walk in the door that got on a red coat, and it might be somebody else's husband. Now what you gonna do with that? The Lord done gave you a dream, this your husband. And he gonna be wearing a red coat when he come in Or she going to be wearing a pink dress. What you going to do? See, see, that's spooking it. God doesn't deal like that. God let you choose your own partner. Woo, Jesus. God is too smart to choose your partner. Because he knows as soon as there are problems in your marriage and it fails, you're going to blame him. And people doing it anyway. And he didn't even choose who you chose. <laughs> and you're still blaming him for your failed marriage. Mm. God may present a person to you. Say present. Just like he did Adam with Eve. 
go to Genesis chapter 2. I know somebody said, where that at? It's in the Bible. Go down to... Uh, okay. We see in verse 20, and Adam was naming all the Adams, uh, animals and stuff like that. And then look at verse 22. And the rib, now that word rib is not talking about the back. It just means part. He took a part of Adam. See, he didn't go back to the dust to make the woman. Because he didn't need that. He needed her to be exactly, say exactly, exactly. like the man. So inside of Adam was everybody that would come in creation. So God went into Adam and pulled out woe man, wound man with man with a wound, and presented. Because that's what that word says. Brought her means he presented her unto him. So Adam could have said, Well, I don't know, God, you know, you got anybody else? God presented the woman to Adam. He didn't force Adam to marry her. He didn't say, this your wife, take her. See, God doesn't choose your partner. You do. And if you choose unwisely, you pay the price for it. He presented her to him, but Adam chose her. Woo, Jesus. Are y'all seeing that? But what I see more common than not is people just like the title of being married. It is like a fad. They're not interested in the parameters that marriage creates. They just like saying, I'm married. They're just like saying, I got a car. Hmm. But God does help us to choose. But you need to follow instructions. You want to write this down. God gave us a brain with 500 billion cells in it. Then he gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us. Then he gave us the word to regulate your decisions. Then he gave you pastors to give you sound counsel. Then he gave you parents to teach you good sense. Then he gave you the anointing to discern. Yet with all these available resources, People still keep right on ignoring and making their own dumb decisions. What are you saying, Pastor Diana? What I am saying is that the difference between you choosing a partner and the driving license is knowledge. What you know is all you can bring into the marriage. So this morning, let's receive the knowledge of God right now. Pray in tongues for just a moment. So Rabba kehe shata. Sende da boko hu sataba ka shonde. Andele bo soho raba ki sataba shande. Handele bo sata. Thank you, Lord. We receive. Love is not the foundation for marriage. Now, we already said love is not feelings. Love is not a feeling. I want y'all to settle down because I don't look. I'm gonna try to get in you as much as I can today. And if I go longer than an hour, you ain't got nowhere else to go. The snow gonna make everybody go home and eat what you shouldn't eat, no way. <laughs> you know when it's cold outside, we want that stuff, the, the comfort foods we call it. And most times it's just sugar. <laughs> All right. Love is not the foundation for marriage. I know this is a controversial statement because when we normally get married to some, we say it is because we fell in love with them. <laughs> Can I say something to you and you receive it? Love, just like sex, does not make your marriage work. Here's a question. How many of you here in this room or online love someone and the relationship still fails? Point proven. Yes. 
You had a boyfriend or girlfriend, and y'all fell out of love. Point proven. You can love somebody and not know how to work with them. Okay, example. You can have a toolkit, spanking brand new. I buy them quite a bit. That's why I use this as an example, because I like tools. You can have a toolkit, spanking brand new, with all the tools in the kit. But when your car breaks down, although you have a kit, you don't have a clue what to do. You got a wrench, you don't know where it's supposed to go. How many of y'all know where to put the antifreeze versus the fluid for your wipers? You'd be amazed how many people don't know the difference. So it's knowledge that's missing. Mm. So love is not the problem. Knowledge is. Say knowledge is the problem because I don't know enough. Now, for those of you that are planning to get married, you need to listen to this a hundred times before you say I do. Love is not the problem. Knowledge is. Love does not keep your marriage together. So you don't lack love. There are others. Say other. Say it again. Say it one more time. There are other things that came up in the relationship that was more stronger than your love. That you were ignorant about. Woo, Jesus. Hmm. It could have been unfaithfulness, abuse, physical, emotional, mental, neglect, or irresponsibility and finances. Something came up that became more powerful than your love. And your love couldn't keep the marriage together. I know. Because I'm using the term because the love I know and the love y'all talk about now. But I got to use what you use. Your love didn't keep it together because something came up that was more powerful than your love. So love can't deliver the marriage. Woo, Jesus. You be trying to work on that man or work on that woman, and you be trying to love them a little bit more, and it's not working, because you're still stupid. <laughs> you might want to write this down. A successful marriage is the result of the application, not having it in a notebook, but the, is the result of the application of knowledge and not the exchange of love. Ooh, Jesus, I know I'm coming at you strong this morning because I got a whole lot that I got that's in me. It's a whole lot in me. I've learned these things over 41 years. It's a lot in me. Listen, you can be in love all you want to, men, but it does not, does not make her the right woman for you. Ladies, you can express your passion for this man all day, and it still does not make him the one for you because you don't know him or her yet. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. When you have it, say, I have it. Wisdom, cha I mean, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. One translation says, wisdom is the most valuable commodity. So don't be stupid. Go buy it. Revelation, that's my, that's my adding to it. Revelation knowledge is what you need. So invest in it. God must reveal the person to you that you are about to marry. But see, we put our emotions out front. And we shut down revelation. So you never get to know the person. 
And then you tie yourself to them. And then you discover stuff about them that you don't like. When you could have avoided a lot of the stuff. Mm. But we act like we're so desperate, we just got to have some bad day. As though God is not enough for you. What you're saying, I just want to have sex. Let's make it legal. Because I'm really not trying to learn you. I just need you. Ooh, Jesus. Here's what you want. You want to understand what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man, how to live with another human being. You need to know and understand the idiosyncrasies of a female. Females are very complicated. And you men have been trying to discover the secret to a woman, but God already told you. You just won't go to God. Women, men are unique. Stop trying to figure them out based on the man you see on the soap operas. He is not that guy. You want to understand how to manage emotions and how to handle anger because it's going to come up. You want to understand the dynamics of disagreements. Why do we need to disagree about this? You know, why don't we just go to the word and discover what the words say about it? Why do we have to argue about stuff? Why do we have to argue about it? because he put his socks over there on the floor and you want him putting the dirty hamper? There's a way to help him. Move the hamper. Problem solved. We make big issues. <laughs> we make big issues out of stuff that shouldn't create the kind of chaos in our homes. You must understand how to handle unfaithfulness, broken trust, should it occur. The first thing we want to do is throw away the whole marriage because somebody was unfaithful. The law allows it. The Bible allows it. But do you have to? Oh, y'all got quiet. But do you have to? It can be fixed. Ooh, Jesus. See, if you don't understand these things, you and love would dump the marriage. You're going to give up on that marriage. Because you're going to grow weary. You're going to get tired of working. Because you know why you get tired? Because you don't know what you're doing. Because we lack knowledge about who we are living with. Many marriages could have been saved, but the individuals didn't have the equipment or the knowledge they needed to fix their marriage. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Now, men, if it seems like I'm, I'm challenging you this morning, that's because I'm challenging you. Because God made you the foundation and the head. So if he started with you and a woman came out of you, you got to get some knowledge to know how to fix your woman. You wait for God to come down and wave a magic wand and fix your wife. You are the fixer. You need to know that. And if she wasn't like that when you first met her, you broke her. You definitely have to help fix her. Watch this, because the Bible commands you husbands. In verse 7, likewise, you husbands, dwell with your wives according to what? No, 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 according to love. He said, you better live with this woman according to knowledge. About what? About the woman. Not about the news. About your wife. Not about sports. Some of y'all know more sports than you know your wife. How many of you know your wife's favorite color? What size shoes she wear? 
What color is our hair? Today, anyway. Because <laughs> we do change. <laughs> But the Bible commands you to live with her according to knowledge, giving honor unto that wife as the weak of Esther. Not because she's weak in physical strength, but because she's supposed to be delicate. She's not supposed to be hard and rough like you. She's not supposed to be abrasive. Ooh, Jesus. That's going to help some of the women. He says, but you're supposed to dwell with them, so according to what? Knowledge. So several things happen when marriages start to fail. First of all, they don't know what to do. Then they get tired and give up. And then thirdly, somebody is unwilling to repair it. You can't heal when both parties are not willing to repair it. You can't fix it. You need to leave it alone. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. N listen, didn't say knowledge wasn't available. They rejected it when it came. Mm. He says, I will also reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Hear me today. Ignorance is a choice. You are stupid, not stupid, that's the wrong word. You are ignorant by choice. Because you can be stupid and ignorant. But, you're not, you, but it's stupid when you get the word and you don't do it. That's when you're stupid. Ignorance is a choice. Listen, you can't reject something that was not made available to you. If you are rejecting what I am saying right now, it's your choice. However, truth is being made available to you. And you can't be helped with what you are unwilling to know. God can't help you with your marriage no matter how long you pray. If you are unwilling to know how to work the marriage. If you think praying is just going to resolve all the issues, you better rethink your prayer life. You've been doing it for 20 years, how it working? Mm -hmm. Therefore, according to this scripture, God will not use you as a representative for him. That's what he said the priest was to represent him. God does not want you to represent him in marriage, and you are ignorant by choice. Making God look like a nutcase. You married to somebody that's dogging you out, and you stay in that mess and just act like uh, God put you there because you said God told me to marry him. And you're so full of pride, you don't want to back out of it. But you're making God look bad. All in the name of love. What love got to do with it? <laughs> then that ignorance is passed on to your children, and they end up having a string of bad relationships. All right. Coming to point number two. The most misunderstood element in relationship is love. I told you that before. Love is a law, and laws have no feelings. There are four kinds of love. The first one is eros, or eros, E-R-O-S, eros. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. Did I? <clears throat> verse 18. See, it's talking about Physical love here. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. It's saying let your sex life be blessed. Mm-hmm. Sex supposed to be good. Eros is not a bad kind of love, but we've done it out of order. 
and which makes it terrible because now we get our signals from sex instead of knowledge. And love and marriage cannot be established on sex alone. It's going to fall apart. So eros is physical attraction. And most time in our society, because it's been blown way out of proportion, it seeks its own interest and satisfaction. It takes possession of the object it loves. This is why when you go to bed with somebody, that spirit of possession come on you. You think you own the person, but you ain't married to them. You cannot monitor where they go and what time they're going to come back and be with you. You don't have any legal rights. I know I'm teaching better than y'all saying amen. But inside, you feel like you own them. Because that's a part of eros or eros love. It's supposed to come in the union and we possess one another. It's not a bad feeling. It's just been used wrong. And it's crippling marriages. This is the driving force for most marriages, even though it is unstable by itself. Eros all by itself is unstable. Because the woman get a hot flash or a mood swing, man, you're going to suffer a little bit. <laughs> if the man go through his menopause, everything is pausing. <laughs> so you can't build your marriage on sex alone. Because it's unstable. Then the second type of marriage is called store J. S T O R G E, store J. Look at Romans 12 10. Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. This is where the bond between parents and children, siblings and relatives is established. That's called sorge. This type of love relies on the expected and the familiar. However, the, and the affection for people that are always around us in our normal day-to-day -day life is the majority, say the majority, of the love we experience even though we call it something else. Most people never move beyond the love for family. Y'all got to hear this. We build our marriages around family ties. I'll talk about that when I get to it. Ah, Jesus, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. This type of love relies on the expected and the familiar. See, you don't have to be in love. You just got to get used to it. Be around it enough. And then we relabel it and say, well, you know, I love them. But you love them because they're always around. That's not the love God talking about. Then there's phileo. P-H-I-L. I A. This is deep friendship love. Now this is as close that you can get to the, the last love without it being divine love. Because this is the door to marriage. You need to write that on your paper. Phileo love is the door, is one of the doors to marriage. This needs to be established before marriage. A deep abiding friendship love. It is the least celebrated in our modern society and even ignored. Why? Because it's the most time consuming. It requires you to spend time to make it work. Because I am learning you in the friendship. I ain't in the bed with you. I am learning you in the friendship. Marriages who never have friendship suffer 
a lot. Because now you're trying to do something. You're trying to be one with no knowledge about being a friend. Ooh. Only a few value it because only a few ever experience it. It is the closest resemblance to heaven without being agape. Friendship is based on two lives intertwining based on common beliefs. See, you, you're going to hook up with a man that don't believe in tithing. But you're a tither. Your marriage is going to suffer. Now, right now, you're not under the curse. But you marry a man that don't tithe, he's going to bring you up under the curse. And everything you have succeeded in life without him, it's going to go away. It's going to fall apart. Because now you're walking voluntarily under a curse. Now, if you don't know if he's not tithing, you need to ask him, do you tithe? Every time, not once in a while. Do you tithe every time? I'm talking to believers. I ain't talking to the sinners. I'm talking to Christians. Is that man a tither? Because if he don't tithe, you're going to walk smack dab into the curse. Ain't no such thing you're going to avoid the law. The law, the kingdom said every believer must tithe and give. You can't access the kingdom without being a tither. See, y'all need, need to learn the law. It's a lack of knowledge. People are dying, the Bible says, because they don't have knowledge. And when knowledge is presented, they reject it. I.E., okay. That's my grandbaby. He learned his vows. <laughs> it is the closest resemblance to heaven without being agape. Friendship is based on two lives intertwining, based on common beliefs. This person is a trusted confidant. Look at John 13, 35. See, we, we, we move so quickly in these relationships, we don't give God time to talk to us. And we certainly ain't going to nobody else and asking for no advice. We go to the person we think that think just like us. You ain't going to nobody that's going to razz Bill Barry and say, girl, what you talking about marrying that guy? What are you talking about? He won't keep a job six months straight. He got, a, he got a ticket record as long as your arm. You get married, all them tickets coming right into the marriage. That means he is, he's a lawbreaker. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I mean, some people got tickets so long, they can't get insurance. The wife have to carry them. You need to know this stuff. Just because they're driving a car, you don't know if they got insurance. And you riding in the car with them. You better know he got insurance. See, you don't know that guy yet. No, because you's in love. But you're being stupid. You better ask some questions. And be ready for the answer. Because it may not be the one you like. Verse 35, what I tell you, 1335. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. What he's saying, the world is going to identify you by the way we handle one another. That deep friendship that's supposed to be a resonating in the body of Christ. I'm not going to expose you because you fail. I'm not going to talk dirty about you. I'm not going to tell all your business to everybody. That's, see, that's how you develop friendship. The Bible says if you want a friend, show yourself friendly. He didn't say get an acquaintance. Talk about establishing friendships. Mm. So that's phileo. And of course, the number four is agape. This is the highest form of love. Unconditional and sacrificial. This love is developed in your personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. This is the type of love that you need 
to develop marriage. Agape love is the only love that makes relationships permanent, possible. This is not normal love. Woo, Jesus. <sighs> All right. You can't experience God's covenant of marriage, which is permanent, without using God's material, which is agape. Marriage is supposed to be permanent. Until death do we part. See, let me, let me just give you a little uh, uh, history here. God didn't invent divorce. Moses did. That's because the women were being so abused by the husbands. Because if the woman passed gas, or if she sneezed, or if, the, or if she burned the food, he felt like he had a right to divorce her. And Moses said to keep these women, he said, now, you need to go read your Bible. God did not start divorce. Man did. And when Jesus was asked the question, Jesus says, from the beginning, it was not so. But because of the hardness of man's heart, Moses told him to write a divorce. So God didn't invent divorce. Because as believers, you should be able to work it out. But what is happening, the Christian marrying sinners and trying to get them saved after they get them married. You're unequally yoked. Or you're unequally yoked because you marry people that don't believe what you believe. He just looks good or she looks fine. And you think you're going to change them once you get married. No, once you have lowered your standards, he does not have to change. She does not have to change once they get married to you. What for? You accepted that lower standard. You better raise your value so high that he may have to go to a mountaintop and jump off to be with you. And then stop going to load the bar to find somebody. You ain't supposed to be looking no way. Going in the hood to get everybody like God don't have no good men. You just ain't made yourself ready yet. I know I'm not saying good English, but it's coming out. Everybody understand what I'm saying, right? I'll talk good English when it's time. See, because love is not an emotion. Let me tell you what emotions are. You ready? Listen, when you see with your eyes someone, you have a pleasant experience because you like what you're looking at. You're looking at their breasts, their hip, their figure. That's the way men, they kind of look you over. Now, for women, we're looking at his height, his eyes, his bow legs. Whatever you're looking at that turns you on at that moment. Watch this. Whatever your eyes have is watching, your eyes sends a message to your brain. Your brain sends a message to your adrenaline glands. And they begin to produce adrenaline. And because this produces excitement, you call it love. No, all you had was a chemical reaction. Emotions are chemically induced based on what you're looking at. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And if you get married based on a chemical reaction, which is eros or eros, the problem with this is that person going to start getting that same reaction looking at someone else. Then a third person. So feelings is not the foundation for a successful marriage. Woo. All right, y'all. You still learning? How much time have I been teaching over there, son? Help me out. You ain't been clocking me. That's all right. That's good. <laughs> Love is the response to understanding the value of a thing. I'll say it again because you want to write that one down. Love is the response to understanding the value 
of a thing. When you love someone or something, you place, say I place, a certain value on them. Woo, Jesus. Example, my husband owned a Rolex watch. He also had an everyday watch. Now, because of the value he placed on the Rolex watch, he purchased a box, which was almost another three, dollars $400 all by itself. That when he wasn't wearing the Rolex, it would automatically turn that watch over every hour so it would never lose time. Say he put a value on it. Now, the watch cost $10,000. Don't you think he would take care of it? He put a value on it. Now, the everyday watch, sometimes he might change the battery and sometimes it might not. It got thrown up there wherever he put the receipts. He had a little tray and it was filled with all his receipts. That's where that everyday watch went. No special care was done for the everyday watch. Y'all hear it? Because <laughs> sometimes the battery will go dead in that watch and he may not change it for the next six months. And I'm going like, because he wouldn't wear the watch every day. He's going like, I don't care. You got your watch on, don't you? <laughs> and as long as he was with me, he said, I know the time. But when he came to church, he going to wear that Rolex. Watch this. The more value someone or something has to you, the more you take care of them. Oh, Jesus. I'm, I'm going to go deeper just a little bit. So love is a response to understanding value. God placed such a high value on us that he was willing to allow his son to die in our place. Listen, so when God looks at me, he sees himself. Let me say that again because you'll catch it next week maybe. When God looks at you, and me, he sees himself. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 talks about, it says, if we believe not yet, he abided faithful. He cannot, say cannot, deny himself. When he look at me, he's seeing himself. Oh, Jesus. How many of y'all? We are made in his image, and God cannot, will not, does not think little of himself. So he does not, cannot, and will not think little of you. Because when he look at you, he sees himself. It's a high value on you. He, that the value was so high that he put all of heaven at stake if Jesus had come and did what Adam did heaven would have been gone God put all that he was on the stake for you and I that's how valuable you are you are worth God can't nobody tell you your worth but God Woo, Jesus Mm. Now, value is measured by what you are willing to spend for something. When you pay for something, that's the value you gave it. If you went to the Dollar Tree and you bought something, that's the value you put on it. That's why you know you figure, I'm going to go back and buy it again and again and again and again. Because it ain't worth but what? A dollar. A dollar twenty-five now. Inflation hit. <laughs> Woo. The more you pay for something, the higher the value you placed on it. The more you are willing to pay for something, the higher the value you put on it. Women, listen to me. You make yourself too cheap. That's why when you get married, you got to take care of yourself. You better keep a job. Or else you're gonna never get your hair done. Cause he didn't put it in the budget for you. Ooh, I'm jumping my lesson. 
Let me say this. What did God pay to get you? God put his whole image on the cross, which means you are worth God. I got to keep saying that. You are worth God. That's how you measure value. If someone claims that they love you, they have a response to understand your value. And your value is measured by what they are willing to give up for you. Do here hanging out with the boys mean more than spending time with you? If he can't give up his homies for you, he ain't the one for you yet, sugar. Woo, Jesus. Oh, I know I'm digging deep. If her mama mean more to her than you, ain't time. Mm. Listen, man, I know I'm digging into men because, like I said, you were the foundation. God started with you. The woman came along. You're supposed to take care of her. The woman gave up all the men she knew before you because she chose you. Now, listen, don't be stupid. The men that liked her. They didn't leave the planet. You men act like your wife, like, like your wife don't, don't see no other man, no other man but you. There are other men out there still like her. Somebody like your wife the way she looks. This is why you need to treat her right. So she wouldn't have no need. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> what are you willing to counsel? To get her. Are you willing to counsel your own mother for her? You men that's so tied to your mama that it's almost like having her in the bed between you and your wife. She needs to talk to you and your mama calls. Who do you respond to first? I can only talk about my house, but in my house, my family didn't come first. Not because I didn't care about them or love them, but they're not first. This, this is a whole different marriage. I, I, can't, I, I don't want to get up, uh, ahead of my notes. Who are you going to respond to first? I am not saying to disrespect your mother. Don't go lie on me. But I am saying she cannot be your number one lady. Woo, Jesus. Put her in her proper place. Your wife should not have to compete with your mama. If your wife still has to compete with your mama and your relatives, then your wife is not the most valuable person to you. And she will sense it. Because the first thing she's going to say, every time your mama calls, you run over there, but as soon as I ask you to do something over here, you can't do nothing. <laughs> Did I hear it? <laughs> Here's my advice or my counsel. I don't give advice because that's a legal term. I give counseling. Here's my counseling. When mom calls, Tell her the truth. Mom, I will talk to you later. I need to attend to my wife first. Help mama to understand relationships because she's missing it too. The Bible says that a man is to leave his mother and his father and cleave. Now that word cleave is a very important word. The word cleave here means to be in hot pursuit of. When was the last time your husband was in hot pursuit of you? Y'all got quiet, what happened? All the jumping up, what up, what happened, what happened? Come on, everybody say this, I was born to leave my parents. <laughs> okay, are you ready for this? I had to learn this by the help of the Holy Spirit. Getting married does not bring two families together. Woo, Jesus. We, I'm going east, east point, going deeper and deeper. This concept of two people bringing two families together invites interference. 
Some people are divorced today because in-laws became outlaws. Family would get in your business and keep all kinds of nonsense going on. No relative, said no relative, should be able to just drop in your house whenever they feel like it. Not mama, not daddy, not uncle, not Susan, not granny. Not cousin boo-boo. No one should be able to drop in your house whenever they feel like it. I know I'm helping. Because y'all might be doing something important. You might not want company at that time. Tell them to call you. And if they get offended when you say, call me, they got the issue, not you. It's a courtesy thing to call somebody. Just don't show up. Y'all got relatives to do that? I'm trying to, help. I'm trying to cover every scope because, uh, now listen, Dr. Davis and I have two children that are married and live maybe 10 to 15 minutes away from me. But I don't go to either one of their homes without being invited. And I know they love me. And I know they look out for me. But I don't ever go to their house uninvited. That's their marriage. Woo, Jesus, y'all better hear me. If you want to keep your children loving you, stay out of their marriage. Because they're going to get mad as soon as they take that bad advice and go try to do it and stuff get worse. Mm -mm. If they need guidance about something and they ask me, say ask, me for guidance. Then, say then, then. I would say something. Just because I discern that they might be struggling with something, I don't jump in. I'll go pray, but I don't jump in. I'm, t I'm helping y'all. Because this has been a downfall of a lot of marriages. Your mama always got something to say about your husband. Your mama always got to say something about your wife. That's negative. Always be, well, you know what? I think he's such a nice person. But, but why, 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 why? See, that's negative. They introduce it with, say, well, like they really like him. But they're going to tear him down on the other hand. Mm -mm. This mama didn't play that one. Uh-uh, never, 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 never. We were several ways before I let you talk against my husband. If anybody got to do the part, then it's going to be me and you. Listen, men and women, protect the sanctity of your marriage. Some things would get resolved a whole lot sooner if your family wasn't involved. Get your mama out, get your auntie out, and everybody else, they've been trying to give you advice, and you haven't brought it to your leadership. If it's that serious, you need to bring it to your leadership. And stop asking everybody in the church. You need to come to the leadership. And then as soon as your business get in the, on, in the airwaves, then you upset. you telling everybody but the right people. Quit asking people. Come to your leadership. They are protected. <laughs> All right, let's move to the next point. Ooh, Jesus. Love is a force generated by a decision. To love is a choice. <laughs> this was good when God said it to me. If God responded to us by the way he felt about what we did to him, we would not be redeemed today. <laughs> you would be in hell, people. See, this is super important. Because true love has no feelings. It's a choice. You can't wait on a feeling to determine if you're going to love someone. Remember, feelings are a chemical reaction to what you see. So if you don't feel like you are not in love, you say you don't love your spouse anymore. Because you're living off feelings and not knowledge. Now, so many women are under so much stress trying to keep their husband's attention on them that they are sick with cancer high blood pressure, diabetes, almost every disease known to mankind enters through the door of stress. 
they're afraid of losing their husband. This is why you need to choose wisely. Your value to this man is too low. If you feel that way, because your man don't value you right. Go ahead and fan. <laughs> Am I saying that you should just let yourself go? Absolutely not. But his or her love should not be structured around your body part or his body parts. This kind of thinking reduces the value of one another. I'm going to reduce your value as soon as something about you change. Love is an act of your will. Come on, I'm going to get ready to close in just a minute. You decide to love your enemies. That's what Jesus said in Luke 6, 35. He says to love your enemies. Continue to treat them well. When you lend money, don't despair if they don't pay you back. For it is not lost. See, if you got a spouse that always borrowing money from you, just let him have it. Let her have it. Stop loaning money to spouses. That's you. You borrowing from yourself. <laughs> mm. You will receive a rich reward, and you will be known as true children of the Most High God, having his same nature. For your father is famous for his kindness to heal even the thankless and the cruel. Show mercy and compassion for others, just as your heavenly Father overflows with mercy and compassion for all. See, Jesus is trying to teach us a valuable lesson here. He's trying to show us how to really love. Because it's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's an act of your will. It's a choice. And in verse 37 in Luke 6, it says, Jesus said, forsake the habit of criticizing and judging others. And then you would not be criticized and judged in return. Don't look at others and pronounce them guilty. And you will not experience guilty accusations yourself. Forgive over and over and you will be forgiven over and over. Give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. Your measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. What Jesus saying? Do it the way I do it. I give not looking for that person to give it back to me. Not because a return is not due, but I'm not I'm not, I'm not asking my husband to make me feel good about me. I'm sowing seeds so I can, God does that in me. Woo, Jesus. And I'm going to give, and I'm going to stop criticizing him. If you don't like the way he dressed, you need to sit down there and have a board meeting. Remember we talked about that? Have a board meeting. Show him what you like on him. Show her what you like on her. Don't criticize her in public. Don't criticize him in public. Because you're talking about yourself. <laughs> Woo. All right. How much more should we forgive those that we say we are in love with? All right. I know I'm going long this morning, but y'all need this. I, I can't stop because it's just the points need to come to a conclusion. And in order to get to the conclusion, I got to keep going. Love is a command, which is a law. We obey laws or commandments out of our will and not our feelings. You don't feel like paying bills, but you pay them if you want to keep that car. It ain't about your feelings. You're doing that out of your will. Are y'all hearing that? So you will yourself to pay your bills. Listen, your spouse would do things that would get on your nerves or they would do things that hurt your expectation of them. But you decide, say I decide. I would love them in spite of how they are acting right now. Since Jesus said that we have the ability to love our enemies, and we do. Now if I can love my enemies, you mean I can't love my wife? It's a choice. Then your spouse that you won't get along with, you have decided not to love them. Oh, 
Lord Jesus, did I hear the, the ruffling of the wind. See, some people are made up in their mind they're just not going to get along with their spouse. I ain't going to leave you, but I ain't going to get along with you. I'm just going to work on your nerves. <laughs> they decided a while back they're not in love with you, and that's what they're running on. Watch this. You must not allow your feelings to come between you and the law. What law? The law of God that instructs us on how to have a successful marriage. You cannot let your feelings get in there and say, that's just too hard. I know what she's saying, but that don't make no sense. We got to go da 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 You come in between what would be successful and what keeps you failing at it. Mm. Are you still listening? For every law of God that you are, un that you are willing to abandon, you give the devil free access to that area. It is uncovered. Mm. Y'all going to go back and look at this. because They're going to say, man, this is a two-hour service. Good. John 13, 34 in the, trans, in the um, passage says, I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone would know that you are my true followers. So you can't be saying you love your spouse, but you're going to treat the brother and sister in the church better than you treat your spouse. That ain't love. Mm -mm. You're supposed to do this all around. This is supposed to be who you are. Everybody that know you is supposed to know you because of your love, your love walk. Amen? Romans 13, 8 says, don't owe anything to anyone except your outstanding debt to continue to love one another. So love is a debt you owe. You owe people to love them. You owe your spouse the right to love them. You owe them that. Mm. Okay, let me keep going. <sighs> For the commandments... Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And every other commandment can be summed up in these words. Love and value others the same way you love and value yourself. Love makes it impossible to harm another. So love fulfills all that the law, say the law, requires. Now love is not a gift but a fruit. And you can find that in Galatians 5, verse 14 through 15, and then verse 22. But the fruit of, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's a fruit. It's not a gift. There's no such thing as a gift of love. It's a fruit. And by the grace of God, it's either in you or you ain't got it. Because love comes from God. True love comes from God. And that's the only way you can truly love somebody is to have God in you. All right. I'm going to close because if you are born again, then you have the Holy Spirit, right? Which means you have the love of God, right? Then why do Christians divorce? Because having the Holy Spirit does not equal to having knowledge. Remember our example of the toolkit? You need to know how to use the toolkit. Having a toolkit is not enough. It's like saying, I'm born again, but you don't know nothing about the kingdom of God and God's way of doing life. The Holy Spirit is the ecclesia who comes to help you, not run you, help you, and to bring things back to your remembrance. Now, what does that tell you? That knowledge had to be put in before the Holy Spirit can remind you. He can't remind you of something you ain't never learned. <laughs> so knowledge is the culprit in failed marriages. So knowledge has to be put in before the Holy Spirit can remind you. So ignorance is the killer of marriages. You know you don't know what you are doing yet. You just refuse to be retrained to what is right and what works. You rather listen to people who have failed in love before you do it God's way. Real love comes from God. Because God is love. All right. I'm going, this, I'm going real deep, and then we're going to close. Can you handle this? I'm going down to the bottom of the ocean like a submarine. He that have ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to you today. 
Now, love is a decision to commit to meet the needs of another for life without, say without, expectation. Ooh, Jesus. This is a high order which requires a level of love and knowledge that most Christians never, ever experience. Love is caring. What is caring? In the Hebrew, caring means to anticipate a need. Caring is to anticipate the need of your spouse and meet it now. Mm. When you care about someone, you study them and what they need and give to them in advance. Example, you don't wait until it's time to sit at the table and eat and your spouse is ready to eat and then you say, oh, I need to go to the store. You don't really care about it. <laughs> Carry means I outthink you. I don't wait until you ask me for something to provide that thing. I am always anticipating what you need and make provision for it before you ask me. That's real love. This is why marriages fail. I'm trying to help you. When a person says that they care for you, check and see what they have made provision for you. What kind of provision they made for you? If you're living in a house now and, they, and they're going to take you to their mama's house, you better stay in your house, sugar. He ain't provided for you yet. I don't care what he say. Let him provide it first. Let him get a place without your name. If you're a good man, he can get it. If you got ragged credit, help him by not joining in. <laughs> if he loves you, he'll restore his credit. He'll fix it. <laughs> According to Ephesians 5.25, the Bible is commanding man to Say, husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to who? Himself. You are presenting this woman to yourself. And how you handle her is a determining factor of what you think of her, what value you got on her. She shouldn't have to beg you for her nails to get done. Now, if you can't handle it in the budget, you need to tell her the truth. But make provision. Start making provision. God will provide the money when you start acting like you want her to have it. But if you constantly complain about her needing this and needing that, God will never give you the money for it. I never asked my husband for furs and diamonds. Never. He would come home with a diamond. The day my husband left this earth, he had a diamond delivered to the house for me. Anticipation. No. He didn't wait till the last minute. It looked like it. Because he could hide stuff in the house and I never find it sometimes. But he always had what I liked. I got albums. It wasn't no such thing just buying one or two cards. Our children understand that because our girls would get two and three cards from their dad for Valentine's Day, birthday. He never just gave us one card. He said, all women need more than one. But he would buy me an album of cards for every occasion filled with beautiful cards because he knew I liked cards. See, that may not be your thing, but that was mine. He got what I liked. He, he studied me enough to know. And I would pull out a card and read something he wrote that was 15 years old. That's how long I got some of those cards that he gave me. I still have those albums. Why? Because he's presented to himself his glorious church. 
And he don't want her to look like she been ruffled up and shuffled over and, and all this stuff. And she weighed down by the cares of life and she looked like she beat down and weather beaten. He want her to look good and stay looking young. Ooh, Jesus. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Most men got a problem loving themselves, so that's why they got a problem loving you. Now, that's a very profound statement. Because most men don't like themselves unbeknown. You know, they, they can be macho, macho, but they really don't like themselves. That's why they mishandle you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast in all your care upon him, for he careth for you. In other words, he said, take a look. Come on, baby, sit down. Pour all your worries and your stress on me. I can handle it. Tell me what's, tell me what's bothering you today. I'm prepared for you. I anticipated that you were going to have a rough day. Sit on down. Let me, let me talk to you. Let me ease your mind. Me and you were built for that. But because you didn't know it, the woman struggled a lot. And she, won't, she don't feel safe coming to you and telling you that she had a bad day. Because she too busy got to keep you from falling off the handle. Because you had a bad day. Mm-hmm. Watch this. God commands us to cast or to throw our concerns to him. For he has already anticipated what we would need and met it. I said met it. God anticipated that we would need healing. Check, provided. He knew that we would need to prosper. Check, that's done. What it takes to maintain his standard of living for us. Check. Provided. He knew we were going to need protection. Check, got you covered. This is why you should go to God without hesitation because He has already provided. Run to Him when you got a need. Because He said in Isaiah 65 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call me, I will answer. And while they're still talking to me, I will hear them. And according to 1 John 5, 14, what it says, people, what is 1 John 5, 14? And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, what does he do? He hears me because he cares about me. And if I know that he hears me, whatsoever I ask him, I know that I have the petitions that I desired of him. That means he already anticipated and he met my need before I ever asked him. This is something my husband would do. My husband had an in-house savings that he used for me and the children. Because he didn't like running back and forth to the bank. And then that's, that's just wisdom. He always had money in the house. And when we needed our hair done, nails done, gas in the car, wanted to buy something, he never said no. He never said no. Why could he say yes? Because he realized that these things would come up, and he provided money in advance for those things. Are y'all hearing me mean? Just because she got a job don't mean you shouldn't take care of her. I had a job for a while. I mean, I worked with my husband. I worked in this ministry, and the ministry gave me a salary. My husband never asked for any of my money. We did not live on my money. I would spend it or give it away. Uh-uh. Now, if I went and bought something, like I had a little credit card, and I told my husband, I said, can I get this? You know, I wanted to get this card. He says, now, you willing to make the payments? I said, yeah, I'll do that. And then as soon as I that got that card paid off, I went click, click, cut the card right up because I ain't like making payments. I want him to take care of me. <laughs> Y'all hear that? <laughs> so many arguments can be diffused if anticipation and provision is done. Watch this now. True love has no reason. You might want to write this down. If you can find a reason why you love someone, you just cancel agape love. If you can tell a person why you love them, it's not agape love. Reasons cancels out agape love. 
This is why you cannot find on any page of the Bible where God says why he loves us. Because agape love is and always unconditional. Unconditional means without requirements. Conditional love means having requirements being met, made, or granted in certain terms. When someone tells you they love you, ask them why. And that why will be the reason that will destroy the relationship. Okay, so you don't believe me? Let me prove it. First of all, if there is a reason, it becomes a condition. That must be maintained. Example, he got a good job making $100,000 a year. You got that Coca-Cola figure. Your hair the right length, and you got white teeth. You about to, he about to keep that good paying job. It doesn't matter that the company he worked for moved overseas, and now you have to look for another employment that may or may not pay him what he was making before. Or perhaps it's your figure. You start out 135 pounds measuring 36, 24, 40. You about to stay this side the whole marriage. These are conditions placed on spouses that are unrealistic and unreasonable. This is not to say that you just let yourself go. But too many times what my, my husband and I saw was pressure put on a marriage from the beginning because one of both spouses had conditions to their love, which is not godly love. See, whenever there are conditions, there is expectation. I expect you to keep your hair a certain style and length. So if you got an issue and something happens to your hair, your hair was the reason I fell in love with you. And now I don't know if I still want to. Because you changed your hair. It gets worse. Expectations guarantee disappointment because nothing in life remains the same. It's all temporary. Something on your body will fall, drop down, get bigger, stretch, wrinkle. Changes do happen. But if you expect your spouse to look like they did the day you met them, you are going to be disappointed eventually. See, you did not anticipate changes and made no provision for them in your soul. See, these types of marriages have never experienced agape love. Conditions cancel out the God kind of love. And usually when a spouse becomes disillusioned and disappointed, they stop looking for the good in their spouse. Wait, it gets worse. Expectations and disappointment will lead to division in the relationship. Have you ever heard this? I did not expect it to come to this. What they are saying is that there is a division in my expectation. You let me down. Division results in divorce. The word the, 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 uh, di means two. Now you have two visions in the same household. He has this thing and she has her thing. Jesus said that a house divided against itself will not stand. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Divorce leads to death or the death of a relationship. And it's all because of the conditions that are placed on one another instead of marrying based on agape love, which says I would love you and be faithful to you and care for you until I die or Jesus comes back. Come on, stand to your feet. I know I kept you a little long. But I needed to get this whole point out. When I go to the next point, I didn't want this dangling. Because marriage is important to God. If you're going to be married, marry his way. Take time to get to know the person. Don't assume you know somebody. Never assume assumption is a terrible disease. You assume you know something about somebody you don't know. It's all right to test them. Find out where they, where they, what they really believe about God. Do you really know what they understand about your God? Do you talk to them enough to know what, they, what they're saying? Can they weather this test? Can they withstand trouble? Man, there is no such thing that a marriage cannot be repaired. If you're willing to repair it, God can fix it. But you both got to work at it. You got to work at it. And it's doable. Challenges come to every marriage. But as believers, God didn't give us the door of divorce just because I don't like your hair or I don't like your size, I don't like your teeth, 
I don't, God doesn't give you a door of divorce. Only, say only, in the case of adultery, will you find in the Bible that God says you have a right to divorce. I know it's a new fad. You don't like them, dump them. Get somebody new. But we're destroying family when we do that. Amen. Father, we're so grateful for this word today. I believe that it's challenging all of us to reestablish our understanding about relationships. I believe you are building strong marriages in this church. I thank you for every family that's represented here today. I thank you for every person that's listening online. I thank you that they would never see one another the same again. But that the Holy Spirit, you, they would give you opportunity to go in and begin to challenge what they know. And they begin to study the word to find out their part. And I thank you for doing it. Because we receive that now. And we thank you that lives are being transformed. People are hearing this lesson. And it's reaching all across the world. Because it's so necessary. Family is crucial, Lord. And it's built on how we handle one another. And we thank you, Lord, for reestablishing marriage in our land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the will of God for you today is in earth as it is in heaven. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Let's get ready to receive the tithes and the offering. Father God, we're so grateful for this great covenant called tithing and giving. Now, Jesus, you are the high priest over the tithe and the offering. Therefore, we have brought out the whole tithe. We have not demoted the tithe in our hearts. Neither have we transgressed against the tithe, but we have kept it holy, set aside for your use only. Now, we've also brought the offering that you put in our hearts. So cheerfully, joyfully, and hilariously, we sow our seed because we recognize and realize and know that you are the Lord of the harvest. You are the one that calls increase. So with great boldness, we decree and declare that money coming to us, money is loosed upon us for the cause of this great and wonderful gospel. If you don't agree with us, tithe and give, because we got supernatural expectations. If you would like to support Rapture Ministries financially, you can do so online. Go to raptureministries.org and click the Give button. There you can give securely through PayPal. If you're one of our local members, be sure to include your CID number and your giving breakdown. We thank you for every gift. You helped make all of this possible. Thank you. Ah, oh, we bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we believe that we receive the bounty on of all of our sowing that is coming back to us good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over when you cause men to give into our bosom. And we receive now supernatural, supernatural money. It's coming our way and money just keep right on coming. And money just keep right on coming. And we receive it now. Now we thank you, Lord, for what you did in this house today. We believe that we have done what you asked of us to do. And we receive this word. And we will take it and let it be nourishment into our spirit, man. And we decree and declare a happy day. Now I pronounce the blessing upon my children. And I thank you that as we leave this house, no hurt or harm or danger will come unto our lives. That we will prosper in this week. That the, that the blessing of God will follow us and overtake us. That the divine favor of God will be upon us and profusely abound in us. That it will surround us in every activity. Everything that we have to do, we will see your divine favor. And we thank you for it and we'll come back together rejoicing because our God is a good God. And we receive it now. Amen. God bless you. We love you. See you on Wednesday night.